So uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm Sharon Peterson with the Montana Bioscience Alliance. And just a few statistics about our alliance. Um, some of our members are here today. Right in Montana, we have 406 bioscience organizations, 2,782 bioscience employees at this time. And these are the new statistics that came from the uh, bio when they do this every year. Um, it, we brag about the original of the biofilm technology here at MSU and um, our Montech incubator in Missoula and the work that's going on there. And they have, we've had 154 industry related patents between 2012 and 2015. So um, I'm sure that's gone up since then, thanks to work from Becky and Daniel and folks like that, our patents are continually growing. Um, and uh, so welcome, happy to be here. Um, happy to have the support from the grant, which is gonna make a big difference for the Montana Bioscience Alliance. And I think it's pretty generous. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'm Brigitte Miranda Freer, and I am the executive director of Montana World Trade Center. And the training event that brings you all here today is actually part of our TechX training series. Uh, we started this training series a couple of years ago uh, with the intention of really moving the needle on Montana's technology exports. And how do we do that? How do we create more pathways for our entrepreneurs and our technology industries. We are very, very pleased to be partnering with uh, the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative group today in bringing you this free training. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll just try to cover it briefly and then I, I hope all of you know that we're having a reception after training tonight that uh, begins at four o'clock so you'll join us there for some comments. But uh, in brief, in brief, we had several partnering entities that came together and engaged in, uh, we wrote a proposal, uh, to, it was accepted by the U.S. Small Business Administration, um, and it was one of seven proposals that was funded nationally, so I really think that Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative uh, and, and the efforts that we'll undertake with this initiative are something that the state can be proud of. And I, I love the fact that the Small Business Administration, I think, really saw in this collaborative group, and I'll tell you who all the partners are, a real opportunity for return on investment. So uh, if any of you have further and more detailed questions about that after this session, I'm happy to answer them, and Sharon would be, and others. But let me just tell you who the partners are. So uh, we've got, as, as Montana Bioscience Alliance is a key partner in this initiative, Montana World Trade Center is a key partner, Montec, which is the Missoula-based technology incubator, uh, which is housing several different bioscience-related firms over in Missoula. Swan Valley Medical is our private sector partner, Ron Zook, you'll be hearing from him a little bit later today. The University of Montana is also a partner, and we have uh, Missoula Economic Partnership is our local partner that's going to be helping us, in particular, in building out workforce, uh, the workforce portion of this initiative, right? So engaging with employers to make sure that we are training um, a workforce that is meeting not just existing needs, but anticipated needs in the bioscience space. Um, other components of this initiative are really providing more outward messaging to the bioscience industry broadly about the critical location factors that exist right here in Montana in support of bioscience firms. Um, and we have actually got quite a bit of, of, of funding in this grant to offer different types of training. So training and technical assistance. So whether it's one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with bioscience entrepreneurs, and, and Ron in particular will, will play a large role there given his experience. Um, or it's the kind of training like you're having today. Um, we're, we're really excited about what this funding will allow us to do as a collaborative. There's also another small piece uh, to this, and it's a one-year contract with an option for four years renewing. We certainly hope that we have the opportunity to do that. Um, 
but there's a, a small pool of funding that basically will allow for little micro grants to bioscience uh, entrepreneurs or businesses or even researchers and developers. We haven't put all the parameters around it yet. That will help them. It's, it's a little. We're calling it the fourth F fund. So it's sort of little tiny micro grants that could help you. Do, you. do you need some money to help you purchase a particular piece of equipment? Would it just be pivotal for you to attend a specific trade show like the bio uh, show that's coming up here in June? Uh, those are things that we want to know about because we've got a little bit of money that we can basically invest uh, and to enable you to you know, bootstrap it, do a little bit more. Every little bit counts. Okay, so um, just want to give you a little overview of the flow of our, our presentation today, and then I'm going to sit down. Um, we have four different bio businesses, I think, that are in the room with us today, and that's fantastic because we really want to have the opportunity for live Q&A with our panelists. And you should know that part of this initiative is making sure that we are able to reach entrepreneurs in all parts of our state, regardless of whether or not it just happened to align with their schedules to be here today. So we are recording this, and this recording that we'll do today uh, will be available, well, first of all, to any of you all, or to any of your colleagues, or to really anyone that is requesting this, um, in a, you know, and we hope that it helps them in their efforts to grow their business or, you know, from, from ideation stage all the way through a successful commercialization and hopefully a global business entity here in, in Montana. Um, all right, so our, I've got a panel of presenters that are over here, but we're actually gonna start right over to my left here. And I think what I'm gonna do is uh, briefly introduce Anne, and then maybe as our panelists come up, I'll introduce them. I'm gonna guess that a lot of you people in the room know our panelists, but the people that will be viewing this remotely probably won't. So our first panelist that we have with us here today is Ann Peterson, and Ann's the program manager for the Montana Innovation Partnership, which is MTIP, powered by MSU TechLink. She's right over that way from us. Um, and they help early stage Montana tech companies compete for federal SBIR and STTR funding. I'm gonna guess people in the room are familiar or have obtained these things. Raise your hand if you've gotten SBIR or STTR funding in the past. Okay, so and when I was thinking about this from the user perspective of a, of a, a bioscience entrepreneur or would-be entrepreneur, I'm thinking Anne is a really important first step, right? Because this money that is provided by SBIR, STTR, um, you know, it, it's nice in that it's non-dilutive capital. Right? So she's going to talk with you more about that and then we'll give her about 10 minutes and go through our panel. Okay? All right. Thanks, Anne. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Welcome. I'm really happy to, to talk with you today. Um, I'm going to pass the slide. As uh, Brigitte introduced me, I take care of the Montana Innovation Partnership. And our focus is really to help high tech businesses in Montana to successfully compete for SBIR, STTR, FENDI. And we're, it's a bit of a relaunch. MSU TechLink took over this program back in the summer of 2018. Uh, so we're, we're funded also by the Small Business Administration, by the Montana Department of Commerce and MSU, although I am a statewide program. So I happen to be here, based here in Bozeman, but I'll be in Missoula next week, Billings the following week as well. Advance the slide. I wanted to talk a little bit. So it looks like a good number of you, and I, I, I do know some faces here, are familiar with SBIR, STTR, award winners here as well. Uh, SBIR and STTR is a, a certain type of funding from the uh, federal government. 11 agencies participate. National Institutes of Health, Health and Human Services are certainly obvious ones for folks in the biomedical to be considering. But I would also implore that you actually look at other agencies as well. Department of Defense also does a lot of health-related bioscience. National Science Foundation, as long as it's not a pharma type of uh, funding, that may be another option for you to consider. But there's some, some really great components about the Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer programs. I'm not, dude, I don't have an hour and a half to do a, an SBIR 101 session here, but here, here are the really the highlights why you may want to consider this type of funding for that early, early stage technology. It's te technology that's pre-revenue, technology that actually is just a concept. You don't have a prototype yet. This is a type of seed funding that is really intended to help innovative technology companies get off the ground. 
It is, as Brigitte mentioned, it is non-dilutive. The government is not going to take a stake in your company, uh, but they do have expectations that your research is in line with their research goals or the agency's specific objectives. One thing that's very new about, uh, <coughs> that just came out in the most recent SBIR policy directives is some IP protection uh, and data rights protection. Previously, any uh, wardy for SBIR or STTR had a certain amount, of, a number of years, four to five years, to commercialize their technology, meaning that you needed four to five years to secure some additional R&D funding or sales into an agency to protect your intellectual property from that funding and that, that you received for that funding. They just upped that to 20 years. And that's a significant, that's really important. What it, it also demonstrates is that it's 20 years, they're, they're giving you 20 years to really commercialize your product. It takes a long time. This is funding for very early stage technologies, so uh, it's, it's one step along your commercialization path. Another, uh, a couple of other components that are really advantageous for the SBIR and STTR programs is that it is a, a little a notch of cred credibility when you are going further to seek venture capital or angel, angel funding to, to have demonstrated that you have a federal agency that has given you money because they have, have had faith in you enough to, for this research, that it does add some credibility to you. So it does help you to uh, secure when you're pitching to investors. Um, and then there are some other elements in terms of, of uh, phase three. Phase three in SBIR really is the commercialization phase. There are phase one, phase two, that's the time where you're receiving SBIR funds to prove feasibility and then develop prototypes of your technology. Phase three means you're sending that back into the agency or into a commercial market. With a federal agency sale, you've already done your competition by winning an award through SBIR or STTR. So you don't have to do another competitive for that same technology, you've met the competitive requirements for that as well. So that's that last element. This graph is also just demonstrates where SBIR and STTR funding is really appropriate. You've come out of the research, the basic research at the university, and you're ready to start up making applied research. So kind of funding cuts off for basic research. This is gonna get you, more than likely, through that prototype stage. It's not going to get you probably all the way to commercialization sales of, of your company product, but it's that significant uh, branch between basic research funding and, and further investment from VCs or commercial sales. Next slide. I wanted to give you just a uh, kind of to wrap up a little bit, uh, I, just a peek at SBAR in Montana. And this is just a snapshot looking at NIH-related technologies. So you might recognize a few of those names. A couple of those names are here, uh, here in, um, in the uh, room with us. But since the inception of the SBIR program back in the mid-80s, over $200 million in SBIR and STTR funds have come into Montana. And at just, 100, or just in the last 10 years alone, over $110 million. So we're really ramping up in terms of our participation in the SBIR program and that impact that it has into our state's economy by that non-dilutive seed funding coming into our, our space. In fact, I don't have it here, but Montana ranks 21 out of 51, 51 being the best, California, you can imagine, having the highest number of SBIR awards. But for the size of our state, we are probably eighth, seventh or eighth in terms of population to have our SBIR ranking be 21 over all of those 51 states and territories is pretty good representation of the type of technology that Montana has. Yeah, we always go on a per capita basis here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're, we're for, for our size of the company, we're, or, well, our, I, our state, we're brilliant. And the, the whole thing is that SBIRs are so competitive. They really uh, are. Montana company have been able to get in there and get some funding and just amazing. Yeah, um, Sharon, that's a great point. Yeah, it is a great point. 
uh, it, generally overall it's for a phase one just to get started uh, it's about a 15 percent hit rate of, of those uh, proposals that are submitted actually win a phase one award so we're, we're clearly a little bit higher than that here uh, another thing just just if we're looking at just the health and human services NIH again I I stress that is not the only agency that you should be looking on depending on your technology uh, but overall it, it's a good one for you guys to look at um, we've had you know over 28 million dollars just in the last 10 years of that type of funding that has come into Montana companies so that's pretty significant some of the, this is a list I just put up there for for names uh, a couple of those have uh, had nice secretive exits as well but so strong commercial success next slide Finally, this gives you just a, a quick snapshot. As I mentioned, other agencies that are participating in the SBIR program, uh, Department of uh, Defense, it, uh, honestly, would be another one that I would consider for health-related technologies. Follow-on uh, slide, and this is this is really to wrap it up. I wanted to let you know how we help the Montana Technology Innovation Partner or MTIP program. I think you have some flyers in your booklet. Uh, uh, that you can share ways to contact me our focus is really outreach technologies collaboration with our partners uh, anybody who uh, would like more support for their early stage technology companies uh, how they can actually compete for this this type of funding that's what we're here to help we can do will do I have experts have expert consultants that will do proposal reviews, We're, we'll do hands-on, and I'm actually trying to get more and more hands-on guidance to help people walk through the process. I wanna make sure that I connect people with their partner resources like the Procurement Technical Assistance Centers, the Small Business Development Centers for those additional, the launch pads for additional support and services when they're doing market research. But we can do a lot of that focus on that high-tech market research and the high-tech commercialization strategies that are required for your proposals. And we also have micro grants. So I would encourage you all to, if you are part planning to participate in SBIR and submit an SBIR, that's my end game criteria for the micro grants, but it can supplement what you're trying to do. If you need materials to do some additional tests, if you need some kind of unique machine, if you need to travel to visit partners uh, or go to conferences. That's, those are some of the types of areas that you can use this funding for. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time, and good luck. Thank you. So simply because I'm not sure how all this will come together timing-wise, I think just hold your questions, and then we'll have ample time. We should have ample time at the end for questions for everybody. So our next presenter that is joining me up here right now is Daniel Giuliano. And Daniel actually got to MSU in 2016, is what I think I saw. 2016, here. right? Yeah, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Silicon Valley, right. where you finally got fed up with the traffic. Oh no, I, I don't know. I'm making that and, up. And all the nice weather. You're right. <laughs> so we're glad to have him in the state of Montana, and um, certainly Daniel, you're representative of the kind of um, really talented people that just end up gravitating to our state in addition to the talented people we're growing in our state here too so we're really glad to have you his current role here with MSU is that he is the director of MSU's technology transfer office and what we thought he'd do here for you today was tell you a little bit about his job how he helps firms like yours and I think you were maybe going to do a little bit of a, a case study how right. you know you worked with a firm recently okay so about one-third introduction to the office and about two-thirds case study. that all sounds good okay, okay. thanks in Daniel. the ten minutes <laughs> yeah yeah uh, and how there's some animation there's some yeah. animation here so um, yeah, so this, this slide, for instance, has animation, so we're gonna step through it, okay. All right, so first, an introduction to the office. This is the, the Office of Technology Transfer at MSU. And we have two primary missions. One is to identify, protect, and license technologies that are being created at the university, license them to private industry. And we are the bridge between the university and industry. That's what this is schematically representing. So one more. So this is technology coming out of the university to industry, so we're taking the technologies out of the university to industry. And the other half of our mission is to take the funding from, that's available from industry, whether that's through SBIR, STTR, or often with the larger companies, they'll just um, directly fund research at the university to help create more technology. And, and under ideal conditions, 
this becomes a virtuous cycle where the technology is coming out of the university and the research funding is going back into the university to create more technology. So it can end up in, in a very productive and healthy partnerships with industry with this sort of uh, model. So one more. All right. Virtuous cycle, that's what my takeaway is here. Okay, so um, let's go to the next slide. What I really want to spend a little bit of time on today is a, is a, is a case study. This is an example with, uh, where the university has worked with a private company to actually stimulate and uh, create uh, a new startup. And the story really begins with the Montana Bioscience Alliance. We have someone on the board of directors there, John Delaney, who is the executive director of research at, at uh, Amgen. And let's go to the next slide. John was invited to the, what's that? Oh yeah, he's a Montana native, he's from Butte originally. Now he's living in California like um, many people who are, are doing the high tech stuff, but he, he was invited to visit the university by our Division of Health Sciences, which we actually have Becky Muhern here in the back, who's a key part of that, to visit the university, see what the researchers are doing, the, the biomedical researchers, um, and see if there would be any sort of opportunities for collaboration or work together, just, just stimulating discussion. So let's go to the next. Um, all right, one more. So he took a particular interest in one of our researchers, Blake Wiedenheft, who does something called CRISPR, which I don't have time to get into and couldn't really get very far in anyway. But essentially, it's a gene editing technology. Very exciting, very powerful, very pretty early, though, in the, the days of that technology. And um, originally, we thought, well, maybe, maybe Amgen will sponsor research in Blake's lab to advance some of the work that he's doing. Um, but then, as we had, had those discussions, it turned out that what they were really interested in was having the venture capital arm of Amgen kind of get engaged with that technology and see if there was a way to um, maybe form a startup around the technology and use that as a vehicle to not only advance the technology, but then if the technology is promising, turn it into a product. So the idea would be, instead of putting direct money directly into the university, Amgen would, re would invest in a startup that was created by Professor Wiedenheft, then that startup would sponsor the research at the university and then have certain rights to the IP that might come out of that research. So that's where we ended up um, in terms of the discussions with Amgen. And that was, a, that was quite a different model. Instead of just funding the research and seeing what interesting uh, findings come out of it, this was really a commercialization, setting the, the technology up on a commercialization pathway, which um, isn't always how, how the university thinks about things. So although the net result seemed like it would maybe be the same, which is money comes in the university to advance the technology, it had a, a very powerful effect by going this route. So let's go to the next slide here. So now instead of the goal being, let's come up with something interesting, let's see what interesting findings we can come up with, the goal is to create a technology that has commercial potential. And this had a really powerful effect, I think, on uh, Professor Wiedenheft. You know, he, he's grown up doing research. He's a fantastic researcher and an overall around great guy, but he's not someone who commercializes technology. So our office uh, spent a lot of time kind of helping him with the paradigm shift in his own mind of instead of just developing um, interesting technology and seeing who else can do something with it, let's roadmap what this technology could do and how it could turn into a product and how you could create a company around that technology to turn it into a product. So um, that took a, few, took a few steps, but in the end, the kind of the pitch that the Professor Wiedenhoff made was quite transformed by just the nature of the funding that we were getting here. Let's go one more. So he created a company, uh, which he calls Surgeon or Surgeon, and we worked with him to refine the business strategy, the, helped him with his pitch to the VCs at MGen, and they, they had a favorable impression and they wanted to invest, and that was done through a convertible note, which you may or may not know what that is, but it's kind of a simple way to get equity in the company without working out too many of the details ahead of time. And in order for him to be able to do that, we had to have a conflict of interest management plan at the university, which is somewhat complicated, but the university is really trying hard to, um, and the state is trying hard to allow these things to happen while following all the rules, not getting kind of tripping over ourselves um, and letting technologies like this sit idle because we don't want to have a conflict of interest. 
Um, and so in the end, we had a sponsored research agreement with the university where the startup surging sponsored the research at the university, and now that research is ongoing. So I think it's too early to tell whether this is going to go somewhere or not, or if the, the research is going to work out the way um, we hope it will. But if it does, the next step would be likely to go get some more private funding to actually take this company forward. Right now it has no employees. It's kind of a shell just to, to house this agreement and this, uh, this research funding. But if, it, if the technology is going to go somewhere, the next step would be to actually have some employees and start doing work outside of the university. Uh, so that, that is the case study here. Let's go to the conclusion slide. Lessons learned. Um, I was really very pleased to see how uh, a motivated and capable individual like Professor Wiedenheft could change their, their mindset from researcher in order to create new knowledge to this is how we could actually take a technology and turn it into uh, something that could be commercialized. And I think it's kind of a microcosm for what we'd like to see uh, happen at the university more, where you have capable people who are um, creating technologies that have commercial potential and not always thinking about how uh, that commercialization would take place. So in many cases, I think um, this can be assisted by partnerships with existing companies. And the, I think the, the in addition to Professor Wiedenhoff's kind of a, you know, general capability, the, the willingness to be flexible and adaptable, I think, was key to making this whole thing work. Okay, one more. All right, so it's still very early in this whole process. It's still just R&D, but this, this startup is, I think, uh, the surging is kind of a model for what we could do in the future when we have technologies that have a lot of potential and haven't quite, um, haven't quite proven themselves yet. They have to bridge that gap, as, as Anne was alluding. You know, to, to be able to take the technology to the point where it is kind of demonstrated, has a prototype, there's kind of a valley of death there. And so this is one model that uh, we found that we hope to be able to replicate in other cases to be able to advance technologies to the point where they can go to the private sector and kind of um, live the, the rest of their lives. So thank you for your attention. I, I'll be happy to take questions or um, discussion later. Thanks, Daniel. bunch of questions later. I bet other people in the room for you will too. Um, so our next presenter up here as we do that little shuffle with the seats over there is actually Ron Zook and um, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. I mean, it's such short notice. I know it was a long trip for you. Ron's a serial entrepreneur uh, he's got over 35 years of experience in the development of emerging growth technology based companies um, it, his experience includes the founding of five successful companies that have become industry technology leaders. Um, as the CEO of seven different companies, including a turnaround, Mr. Zook has developed significant expertise in diverse markets, including medical device, biomedical, health information systems, telecommunications, instrumentation, and information technology. You all have a, a more extended bio of Ron's there, but you know why we asked Ron here today was really uh, because I think that entrepreneurs and aspiring entrepreneurs maybe internalize information and learn best when they hear the experience of their peers. So in our TechX case studies, we, we always make a point to have uh, at least one business really telling the tale of you know, starting your company, challenges you faced, um, really you know, kind of in, in Ron's case, he's already gotten to the point of some international sales with this company. So he's going to talk a little bit about commercialization, scaling, and glowing, going global uh, with a private sector perspective. And because our other presenters were so efficient, if you want, I will not stop you at 10 minutes. You can do like 10 to 15. Thanks. Yeah, I've never been able to give a talk in less than 10 minutes. Well, you're in I'm luck. Try. You don't have to. Um, just as a contrast, one of the previous companies I did was a tech transfer from the University of Colorado with two college professors that were part of the a founding team. And we raised capital for that company. And a success story, we sold the company in 2012 to a multi-billion dollar company in the UK. Uh, had 400 employees. And uh, so it was a very great success story, but it was a tech transfer um, uh, process that at that time in Colorado was difficult and I can see the challenges that are up for you is is getting uh, that match up with commercialization and private industry with academics and so Swan Valley Medical is a little bit of a contrast to that because 
this technology didn't come out of the university anywhere. It was basically conceived of as the application by a, a Montana urologist. And I won't go into details of what the product really is, but it basically, it's a surgical procedure, minimally invasive, that replaces an open surgical procedure that usually lasts one to two hours with post-op hospitalization. And we can do that procedure in the physician office in five minutes. Uh, we also have another application for it which changes another procedure, same instrument, uh, from a 4.4% mortality rate and a 45% complication rate to zero mortality and with a 3.5% complication rate. So the value proposition with this company and, and the idea was originally focused on uh, the immediate benefit to the surgeon, the application of the in instrument. But one of the things that I've always noticed, and, and when we do this, is and what I encourage other companies to do, is really understand your market first before you go off designing and developing a product. And, and so what we do is we spend a lot of time understanding that, and, and particularly the medical device industry has some unique issues that you have to really validate in the marketplace, and it can have a great impact on time to market, cost to get to market, so the amount of capital you'd have to raise. And so understanding that up front is really important. And so we spent a lot of time understanding uh, who our, our customers were. So we were basically selling the instrument to urologists, but our real customer who bought the product was hospitals. And unfortunately, during our whole t period of time in developing this company, we had the Affordable Care Act come in, in place where the whole industry became basically got into turmoil. And we have a lot of hospitals struggling now for survival. And so there's a lot of consolidation going on. So among, during this whole time of all this turmoil, we basically had to really understand, you know, how do we play in this and where, where's our value proposition? And, and to really understand, it was very easy to understand the urologist's perspective. We just are giving him a much better instrument that's a lot safer for patients in reducing mortality and morbidity. So the other part of this is we spent a lot of time in understanding the market and our other customer, the hospitals, and what was their value proposition. And so you know what drives hospitals is both clinical outcomes at lower costs. And so having to match up with that and having that message. So we focused a lot on, on in the development of the product uh, during that period of time, uh, spending a lot of time on understanding the gateways to the marketplace. and understanding reimbursement rates, pricing, and costs. So you have to really have a very good understanding, spend a lot of time up front understanding what you're trying to develop and what are the constraints in the marketplace, in particular reimbursement and competition, et cetera. So the other part of that is, is, is that the real value in all the companies that I've been involved in as an investor or an operating officer is that IP is extremely important. That's the value you sell when you sell a company. And I, I know Tony will talk about this, but IP is extremely important. And so we focused real heavily in the early stages of development on not only understanding what IP is already out there so you don't infringe, but also you know, what can you protect and where do you want to protect it. So it, it ties into your market assessment and where you're going to go with the company down the road. So right now we have 32 patents issued on this device and with several pending. So we have a lot of IP that we've developed that creates barriers for competition. Our, our market worldwide is around 40 billion annual uh, with no competition. The US market is around 14 billion annually with no competition. And so we started the company out at selling to urologists. And what we needed to do is not only validate the safety and efficacy and reliability of our design, but we also had to fit it into the marketplace and understand can we maintain this reliability and quality of the procedure in diverse markets. So we launched the product in, into several markets, the EU, um, US, uh, Canada, and Mexico is where we focused initially. Now we're spreading out into uh, Saudi Arabia and the Middle East and because they spend a lot of money on healthcare and uh, Japan and China. Uh, we're having discussions going on right now. So part of this process of developing the product, getting the IP in line, understanding the market, who your customer or customers are, and then what is the value proposition that you can offer them that would entice them to buy your product. And so we started out, as I mentioned, just 
is validating the safety and efficacy with the urologist, the user, and now we've just recently switched to focus on the market development through the hospital because the volume of this product uh, can save a lot of lives and save each hospital that implements this uh, millions of dollars a year in reduced length of stay and complications and infections. And so the, the focus right now in the U.S. particularly is, is infection control because under the Affordable Care Act, hospitals are no longer being paid for infections acquired during your stay or complications. So the Affordable Care Act, as when it came in, it started changing the dynamic of what value proposition you needed to address. So being aware of what's changing around you while you're developing, instead you, got, you have the blinders on developing a product, but you have to understand what's happening in the, in the global marketplace and, and what, the, what are changes that are gonna affect how you sell your product and how you deliver it. And so right now we have is, is we can walk into any hospital in the US and give them a custom analysis of what this would, if they implemented this device in, in treatment of their patients, they could save millions of dollars a year specifically to how they would implement it in their patient demographics. So it's customized, and we have 160 clinical references that support the, the supposition of the value and, and the, the consequences of using our device. So it has to be clinically justified. You can't just you know, assume that you're going to have these benefits. You have to base it on clinical evidence. So we've done that, and so right now we're in the process of scaling up from there. And, and there's a couple things that I want to press upon you too, is when you're, when you're starting the idea and, and forming around this technology and doing your market assessment, part of that is, is all of the different things that you need to develop kind of in parallel. You know, you have to start looking at the IP, um, you have to look at the market assessment. How am I going to get into the marketplace? Who are my customers? And what is that going to cost? What's the timeline? What kind of clinical trials or studies do you have to do? And what kind of capital do you have to have? So the number one problem with most startups is lack of capital. Uh, we've invested $20 million in our company to date. That's significantly less than any other company that's done what we've done today. And I compare that to another company that I was mentoring um, for the last several years, and we sold the company in 2017 for 1.1 billion, but we had to invest 175 million in it. So I've got 20 million in this company, and my valuation is going to be much higher than that company. Uh, we can, if we develop, I had a recent meeting with the president of HCA hospitals, and they have 179 hospitals in the US, largest hospital network in the country. And the president was so excited about it, he brought in their vice president of investments halfway through the meeting to, to hear the rest of it. And he started proposing to invest in us or buy us. And it was trying to convince me that they would have give us better access to the market than, than we would have going outside of that, say through a corporate strategic partner. So what we did is, is with just 179 hospitals, if we implemented our technology in all all of those hospitals, that would represent over 600 million annual sales to us. So we're on the verge of, you know, kind of exponential growth. And so what, I, what you need to look at is, where is your capital going to come from? And at different stages, this can come from different sources. I've, I've done a turnaround, as, as you mentioned, with a venture capital company, and I don't like working with venture capital, quite frankly. Um, I like to stay in charge and in control. And so I don't allow them to invest. We've had lots of people ask to invest in us, and I've even solicited some investment from some of the venture guys that I, that I like and have worked with, but uh, the terms were just not right. And so you have to think about that when you're first starting a company, too, is where's your capital going to come from and in what stages? Because a lot of times you, get, you, know, you can get some funding through some government grants. Uh, you can get some private family money, uh, individual investors, and then venture capital, and then corporate strategic partners can also be a source of, of great capital, as well as access to the market. So we, ha we are in discussions with several multi-billion dollar companies that are corporate strategic potential partners for us to get into, especially in Europe, Japan, and China. So we're, we're talking to those guys as potential partners to expand into their, those markets. But we're basically reserving the U.S. market for ourselves. So one of the other things that we're doing is that 
and I would encourage anybody when they're putting a business plan together is to understand what their total capital requirements are going to be. Try to focus in on when you're going to stage that because I always believe in staging funding based on the status of the company or the risk level so that your early investors get the benefit of the higher risk, lower price of the stock and so that they can make that money up downstream. So understanding what your total capital requirements are is, is really key. And then, and then look at what sources you're going to get it from. Um, you know, fortunately, I've done so many deals. I have a lot of people I've made a lot of money for. So they always follow me around. When am I going to do another deal? They ask to participate. So I have some, some uh, investors that are not even in the healthcare industry that have invested in this. So I think that the thing is to look at where that money is going to come from. Uh, I think the corporate strategic partner route can be a very good arrangement because you get two things. You get access to the market, you get their expertise, you get their name, uh, and you get your capital. And we're seeing a change in the industry. There's, this is evolving over time, but I've seen a marked change, and especially in the last 10 years in the medical device marketplace, where there's less innovation going on by the large companies because the market is consolidated into very large multi-billion dollar companies, all the innovation is coming from small entrepreneurial companies which lack capital and lack the access to the marketplace. And it's becoming extremely expensive, as I mentioned, $175 million to go with a direct sales organization with this other company uh, is not even affordable for most companies and most venture capital companies wouldn't even invest that kind of money. So I think it's really important to kind of understand that part of the process and then tailor your, your business plan around it. And you can also also have a, a different strategy instead of building the value up to the company yourself uh, is licensing it to one of the corporate strategic partners. And then you'll have an income stream down the road. So there's a lot of different avenues you can follow. But the bottom line is, is if you don't have any IP, it's not going to do any good you won't get to that exit. You'll have a bunch of competitors and the market won't be to you. So we have a market, like in the US, 14, 15 billion, no competitors. And we have very solid IP. So when, when people come in to look at us and evaluate us, especially the corporate strategics, they look at your IP portfolio first. And they'll, and they'll tell you, when they come back, it says, if you've got a very strong IP, you know, we'd like to participate. Because they know some of these markets have a very long development time. And, you know, even though we are selling right now in Europe and, and we'll be in Asia and in Japan, uh, yeah, we basically are at the stage now of shifting gears away from the urologist to selling to hospital networks now. So if I can walk into HCA and get access to 179 hospitals, I no longer need a direct sales organization. So I've kind of reinvented how do you go out and market a product without a sales organization. So we're, I actually am using ex-CEOs of hospitals to network around to get me in the C-suite. I can show them the economics of this. They introduce me to their cl top senior clinicians, and then they, we pull it together. And, and once, say, HCA implements it with one of their hospitals, I don't have to go knocking on the doors with all 178 other hospitals. They will make it happen. So I'm going to be able to get to market um, at a lot less money, again, less than $175 million. I can remember uh, mentoring this CEO, and it was his first CEO job, but he had really good senior management experience, and, and he was up to about $40 million in sales and needed to get to some more money from his investors, and he said, you know, this direct sales organization I'm building is just extremely expensive, a million dollars a year per person, and he needed another 25 guys. And not knowing when he's going to cross that threshold of positive cash flow. So that can be very risky. Uh, and so really understanding that landscape uh, ahead of time can help you tailor where you're going to go for money and how much money you're going to have. And then, again, uh, there's lots of different ways of going about it. Uh, again, the venture capital community is out there. They've moved away from the earlier stage uh, investments primarily. In fact, most of the middle market investment funds in the 200 to 400 million don't even exist anymore. So you have the real small funds that invest very early, and then you have the funds that invest in a later stage like a company where we're at, everybody wants to participate. Well, too late, guys. You didn't help on the front end. So it's, you know, there is a void of capital in that, in that space. But 
Um, the takeaway from this is, is I think a couple things. One is, is understanding your market first. I mean, I, this was kind of a, a comment I made on all of the research projects and proposals for, for the grants we reviewed a couple of years ago, uh, that there was a lack of market assessment. You know, so really understanding who your customer is and what the size of the market and the barriers are uh, up front, really, along with the IP, is, is extremely important. Um, and so the IP is good, but you also have to understand where you're, who your customer is and what, what value proposition they have. And, and then, then you can pull it together from there. Um, I think that's yeah. as fast as I can do it. Thanks, <laughs> Thank you. Um, a lot of information there. <laughs> and um, one of the things that's so interesting about the, our Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative, too, and we were just thrilled to be able to partner with Ron in this because he actually is also going to play a really important role in the mentoring piece of this initiative. So if you heard some things in there that you really like to be able to tap into Ron's mind on the strategy side, um, I encourage you to, to reach out to us after this to try to set that up. Um, really just, there's no replacement for years of experience and, and commercial space. I was yeah. going to mention, I, I brought some samples of some of the literature we've developed, uh, just if anybody would like to sure. look at it, we have like a private placement memorandum, uh, product literature, oh, that's great. Um, analysis, you know, the, 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 your audience when you tailor your information, like a physician, you know, they don't, they're not going to read much, so you have to be very short and brief, which I'm not, but um, we have a, a, you know, a nine page slide deck that tells them everything they really need to know. But we have also a clinical reference list that documents 160 clinical references that support what we're saying. And so we made it easy for them by you know, pulling out the top 20 or so and doing a profile by category so they can kind of pick which ones they want to look at. So you know, kind of knowing your audience and what kind of material you want to develop uh, is good. And then our website is also, we have uh, training on using our surgical instruments in five foreign languages so you can just walk through it, um, that kind of thing. So, Anyway, this, this gives somebody, yeah. anybody wants to look at what yeah. we've developed for this. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see it, and if you're willing to share it, I'd love to. Sure. I mean, that's a great resource. We know anytime you don't have to uh, reinvent a wheel, <laughs> you have sort of a model that you can potentially at least borrow portions of that's helpful. Thank you very much for sharing your story. Um, and so our last panelist uh, is Tony Tease. And uh, Tony, you started your practice, I think, in 2003 yeah. in Montana. Does that sound right? And did you come from the East Coast? I think you did, or no? Well, way back before. Yeah, yeah, well, OK. <laughs> well, in any case, very glad to have you here. Um, she works uh, with Montana, well, myriad businesses across Montana, including many, many different manufacturers who are looking at, at selling their products internationally. Um, oh, let me read this here. Um, global technology companies, uh, oh, expertise, especially in intellectual property protection, which Ron teed up very nicely there, so we're going to talk about that. International patent and trademark protection, export licensing issues, which may be applicable to some of your firms. Um, yeah, so we're going to have her come up and just kind of share her thoughts uh, relevant to maybe what she's heard Ron talk about, but just also sort of best practices in general um, for companies that are looking at um, protecting their IP, succeeding in the U.S., and getting ready for success abroad. So, all right. In 10 minutes. Yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> I'll give you a 15. <laughs> well, great. Thanks for the invitation. I, I always like to come and, and do these events for the Montana World Trade Center. I thought I would divide my remarks this afternoon into three areas. First, tell you a little bit about myself and my practice so you know what kind of resource you have here in Montana. Um, then I'd like to talk about legal issues that are specific to the protection of intellectual property internationally. Okay, there are a number of treaties and some of that is new. I'm just a teaser. I've got a, a breaking news I'm going to share with you uh, on the international legal front. And, uh, and then thirdly, I'm just going to touch on some of the themes that Anne brought up in terms of government contracting, okay? 
So in terms of who I am, I know probably about half of you in the room already know who I am and what I do, but uh, I'm a registered patent attorney, uh, one of few in Montana. I, I do believe that I'm the only attorney in Montana who specializes and practices exclusively in the area of intellectual property law. So I made that decision in 03. I've been practicing since 1990, but made that decision in 03 when I hung my shingle, and it was a little bit risky to tell you the truth. Um, Ron was actually Dr. Ken High, who's the inventor um, of the technology technologies that Ron has built his company around was uh, one of my earlier patent clients. I personally wrote um, the very first patents uh, that now form the basis of the Swan Valley Medical um, patent portfolio. So I'm responsible for those drawings of the catheter capture device going through the human and uh, worked with my draftsman on, you know, that was kind of fun, how we would uh, make those figures work and tell the story because a patent application really is a story of your invention and I could talk about patents for an hour so I won't do that, but uh, that's that's a big part of uh, the fun part of my practice is helping present the problem, tell the story of how you solved it, and the hope is before the examiner gets to kind of the claims and the detailed description of the invention, he's already in the, or she is already in the mindset of, you know, okay, this sounds like something novel to me. So there's, it's as much an art as a science on the drafting of patent applications. I know Becky, who's read a lot, and, and Dan um, will certainly tell you that. So um, in terms of what we do, our practice is international. Um, very much international in scope. So we represent, uh, I would say, Montana and Wyoming companies primarily that go want to protect their IP internationally. And then the other way around, um, we, ha we represent foreign companies who want to protect their IP here. And you might wonder why they come to an attorney in Billings, Montana. Um, I, I've, I've um, served in leadership roles in the American Bar Association in the IP section for a decade. and. Um, uh, so based on a lot of those connections and just reciprocal relationships with the firms that we use um, internationally. So we have a worldwide network of foreign associates. So uh, from my office in Billings, we can help you protect your intellectual property pretty much all over the world. We represent um, several of the companies on Anne's slide. I'll mention some of them. Uh, Golden Helix, Dermaxon, Meadowlark, Neuralynx, ZDI, and others. And frankly, some of the individuals who were predecessors to some of the business entities that I saw on that slide. Um, one other thing about us, and then I'll move on to the international. Um, we do represent MSU Billings um, directly in connection with its patent portfolio. Um, we, we obtained and filed the first patent application on behalf of MSUB, so we've been assisting them over the years in building their portfolio. Of course, MSU in Bozeman has a much larger one. We also, a significant part of our practice is representing faculty members who are doing businesses on the side and outside of uh, MSU here in Bozeman, and also individuals who might have received a uh, sponsored research agreement, which Dan alluded to. Um, we help advise those individuals as to how best um, you know, address their intellectual property rights and commercialize uh, that research that they've, they've received funding from the university to pursue. Um, so that's a little bit about what we do. On the international front, um, there are international patent, trademark, and copyright treaties. Uh, the fourth bucket of intellectual property law is trade secrets, and all I'll say about trade secrets today, because trade secrets are pertinent to this group, you know, not so much with a piece of agricultural machinery that I could take apart and figure out how it works, but for you all, trade secrets are going to be a part of your IP portfolio. There is no registration system, uh, domestic or internationally, for trade secrets, okay? You have to protect your trade secrets through solid contracts. That's all I'll say about trade secrets. On the patent front, you probably know it's Patent Cooperation Treaty is the main international patent treaty. Um, and then the Madrid Protocol. And countries continue to accede to these two treaties, you know, on a pretty much a weekly basis. Um, but the Madrid Protocol is a, a much younger treaty, and the U.S. I think joined in 2003, the month after I hung my shingle. Um, but it has saved that—that that is the International Trademark Treaty. It has saved our clients. I usually tell them you're going to spend one third what you would spend um, if we had to hire foreign trademark counsel in all these various countries to register your mark. Okay. Um, I will go ahead and share the breaking news. Canada is joining the Madrid Protocol as of June, and this has been a long, long, long time coming. 
for my clients. I've got one who cannot wait, so I just hired Canadian Council yesterday to file three more applications for us, but after June, it's just going to be a checkbox on, on an application that I'm otherwise filing for my clients, so instead of costing 3000 to hire directly, it's another you know, 300 500 bucks or whatever when we file that international application designating all of the, uh, the other countries in which the client wishes to protect its mark. So, uh, another relatively recent development on the international front, and I do have an article about this on my website on the inter in elections page, and I can email it to you, to any of you who are interested, is um, the United States recently joined the Hague System for the Protection of International Designs. This is relatively recent. Um, I'm being recorded, so it's probably wrong, but I want to say 2016, somewhere in that ballpark. But we have now obtained probably about a dozen international designs. What am I talking about? It's the equivalent of a U.S. design patent, okay? You go outside the U.S., they don't talk of it as uh, as a design patent, they call it an industrial design, even in Canada. So outside of the U.S., your designs, the you know the, the front grille of your, I'm thinking of Ford, uh, the front grille of your of your vehicle. Uh, we've done a hanger counter um, uh, for Sims Fishing. We've done waiter designs and other garment designs. So we have um, protected a number of like I say, the equivalent of design patents internationally now through this international treaty, which again renders it a lot more cost effective for our Montana and Wyoming clients. Um, okay, so that's on the international front in terms of direct protection of your IP. Um, by that I mean patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. But an important component, and I'm sure Ron would uh, emphasize this as well, as Dan and Ann and others, is the contracts that surround your business. So this is where I'll segue to data rights a little bit. Um, we are working with a client right now in negotiating a special license agreement um, with the Department of Defense for his firearm uh, invention. So we first, in terms of order, we first you know, filed his patent application and obtained his patent. This is just for this particular client, he proceeded in this order, and then went to the government with that protection and is now um, negotiating, I think, a $30 million uh, research agreement with DOD. So um, make sure you're, you're reading those contracts. Make sure you understand the different levels of data rights. Data rights is kind of, in my opinion, a bit of a misnomer. It's more than just data. It kind of has to do with rights to practice the invention. But So you'll want to either work with someone to read those contracts carefully or make sure you understand them. One other um, quirk that I've run into in representing a, it's actually an MSU Bozeman a grad student, and this is in the, the biomedical area. Um, we've got a PCT application, and pursuant to her NIH grant, she was required to file, and Becky's probably going to nod her head, she was required to file her PCT at the 10-month mark rather than the regular, the typical one year. So if I've lost you there, um, uh, the foreign filing deadline, okay, pursuant to the Patent Cooperation Treaty, is one year after your earliest filing date, which in many cases, it doesn't always have to be the case, but in many cases that's going to be your U.S. filing date. So most of our clients file in the U.S. first. Lots of other ways to skin this cap, but you file in the U.S. first, you do your PCT a year later, and that PCT claims priority back to your U.S. filing date. I know I'm talking very quickly, but uh, something to keep in mind, because if that NIH grant required you to file at 10 months and you've got a calendar for 12, you're going to be a world of hurt, uh, in a world of hurt, okay? Another important topic in terms of government-sponsored research is election of title. And I will never forget this because this poor gentleman came to my office three or four times and we had many conversations during which, which he agonized because he came to me after the fact. and. I think about two years after the fact, and had not elected title. It's very simple, but you have to be aware that in, in, under some contracts, there's an affirmative obligation on the recipient of those, of those funds to elect title. All you have to do is tell the government. It's not that hard, but you have to do it within a certain time frame. So this guy woke up two years later and said, okay, now I'm ready to commercialize this, and the contract agent he had dealt with at the agency had moved on, and all he had were emails, so it just it, it wasn't wrapped up. Um, so election of title is a big issue. Um, and the other issue with regard to government funding that I'll mention, and these are all based on actual you know, client cases that we have, is um, 
consider your subcontractor award. So many of you receiving grants um, might turn around and, and bring in subcontractors. Be wary of those subcontractor contracts because if they don't include an assignment of IP back to you, it um, doesn't matter that you're paying, and this is true in any context, even outside the government funding context, but we're talking about that here today. Um, if there is no assignment of IP from that subcontractor to you, you may have paid them with the funds you received from you know one of Ann's agencies, but you're not going to own that IP at the end of the day. So that's just a flavor for some of the work that we do with our clients in sort of the government contracting space. So um, happy to answer any other questions you have. But um, thanks for your indulgence today. Good to see Becky again after all these years. <laughs> Thank you. Let you back in there. Um, so I actually would really like. I guess I'll go over here. Uh, for, if there are any questions coming from the folks in the room here, uh, I know we've got a couple different companies that are represented in the room. Please ask them. I've been advised that I think that's our microphone there. There? Okay. Okay, so you might have to speak up and or get closer to it would be helpful. So do we have any questions coming from the room here? And if not, I'm going to ask some of our presenters. Um, we've got, oh, we've got, why don't you come on, John, would you come up? Sure. A little closer. I'm afraid you're so far away. Is he too far away from the mic back there, I think, right? Okay. Is he good there? Sure. Yeah. All right, let's do it, John. John Nagy, uh, founder of Nanovale. I'm curious, uh, maybe Tony and Ron can, can uh, weigh in on this. To file patents as a small company is a costly affair. I usually think of a U.S. patent as being about between ten and 20000 International PCT, you're looking at about 100,000 if you're going to go to major countries. Sort of, what's your cost versus benefit? If you just don't have the cash, go with US and then go later with the international filing. Do you guys have any feeling for that? You want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, I think the thing to do is look at your market and prioritize the, the territories where you'd like IP protection based on. Uh, accessibility and size of the market and so uh, that way you can you know cover the, the major markets uh, with fewer patents and have the majority of the, the markets tied up where it wouldn't be feasible for say a competitor to kind of come in and, and since they're only limited to a smart, smaller market so that's one way to limit your expense um, I, I, everything's moving more towards and Tony can comment on this too is that we used to load up each application with lots of claims and that everybody's moving away from that and in Japan in particular is it's almost like you can only have one claim per patent and so you can end up with 20 patents there versus you know etc also you can save money by having a partner uh, say if you have a distribution or corporate strategic partner in a particular location uh, you can use them to actually do the patent work, assign the patent to you under certain conditions, legal conditions or whatever, you know, if the thing broke up or whatever, you get the, the IP back or, or they do it uh, because they're in country and they can do it for cheaper uh, and more efficient, especially Japan, it's a relationship kind of thing and, and you know, so we've done that before where we've used a, uh, a large, large conglomerate in Japan that was going to be our strategic partner and they actually filed all of our IP in Japan for us and then assigned us the, the rights to the patents. Two comments, John. I agree with those numbers. And are you using the PCT or going direct foreign? Explain the difference. Okay, because there is a strategy, filing strategy, that will buy you time and I'll attach numbers to it. So you would file your US application first and I'm not gonna address provisionals right now. Um, but non-provisional, 10 to 12. Um, a year later, you do your PCT. That is about $4,000. If you're being charged more than that, you're being ripped off because the filing fee, okay, this is not per country filing fee. These are, the PCT system went away from having to designate individual countries about 15, I don't know, years ago. But so it's, but the filing fee is about 2,500 right now. So, and then we do like 950 or so, so it should be 3,500, you know, somewhere in that ballpark to file the PCT, patent cooperation treaty. Now you're patent pending in virtually every developed country around the world, okay? That buys you another 18 months before you have to enter the national stage. So my comment, Ron's talked about sort of partners and who's gonna pay for all this, but 
we sort of work with clients to figure out how to make your money last and keep your patent pending until you have to make that those tough decisions about national stage. So. Yeah, you know, I, just as a benchmark, we've spent a little over a million on our patent applications uh, worldwide, and you know we've been pretty conservative about major markets. You know, we just said you know you've got the EU with 26 countries or whatever uh, that participate in that, and then you know Japan and China. China we actually have uh, been issued four patents in China. Um, and whether they, you know, I think it's going to change how they're going to honor those patents in the future. We're seeing uh, change there already due to the administration's uh, forceful uh, uh, stance on, the, on that issue because it's been where, you know, even in Japan, if you really looked at the, the patent protection is, is if you don't, if you file there and, and you don't use your patent once it's awarded within a certain period of time, you can actually, uh, other people can actually use it. And that, that is existence right now in Japan and China. And Turkey. Yeah, Turkey. Mm -hmm. FYI. Market. <laughs> <laughs> I got firearms guys nice in oh, Turkey. Yeah, that's close. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> and if you found it refreshing that you had an attorney and give you actual numbers and some insight into some real strategy there, that's why I invited Tony. <laughs> All right, uh, we have another question right here. And tell us who, and the people listening from afar, or who will be, who you are in just your firm. I'm Elizabeth Corbin. I'm a recent uh, PhD graduate here, Martin and Maine, uh, and have a provisional through the Tech Transfer. Um, and I'm kind of, as I'm getting more familiar with the landscape on which I may be working, uh, I'm looking more and more towards my initial provisional was about the method that I developed. Mm -hmm. Um, and now I'm thinking about just keeping that as a trade secret. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and patenting each different formulation that we come up with in the uh, specific ones. Do you have anything to say about that? Are there different costs associated? Because that would be more patents than patents. But the information is out there for a chunk of the day. And it's Elizabeth, right? Is that for me or Dan? I can't tell. Well, anybody have anything to say about this? I'll, I'll start because um, I agree with you as well. When you talk method, that that smells like a trade secret to me. Um, interested to hear what Dan thinks, but um, and then in terms of the alternate formulations, and this is the kind of patent work we're doing for Dermaxon, so they would be an example, you know, that would come to mind. Um, you might be surprised, and MSUB as well. You might be surprised how many alternate formulations we might be able to include in the same patent. So yeah. There might be a way to group those together. I, I agree with what uh, Tony just said. Um, of course, it's our office that is filing the provisional for, for mm -hmm. this particular technology. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, methods are kind of notorious for being difficult to patents to enforce. You're letting the world know exactly how you do things, and if you can't tell whether they're doing it or not, you haven't really accomplished anything. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. well, I mean, you might be able to, you might be able to write it in a general enough way that. You're capturing many different variants in the method, but the method is can be unless there's something in the end product that you can detect that tells you they must have used this method. Um, it's not it's not the strongest patent, it, and, and trade secrets are often the stronger way to keep that protected. If you can then have a composition of matter patents on top of that, so that the products people are seeing are patented and the pieces that they can reverse engineer are protected. That's that's a good healthy strategy. I mean, IP strategy in, in general is a pretty nuanced topic, and I think we could probably spend um, at least an hour just discussing it. But I think, in a nutshell, you're so on the I right track. I kind of had a knee jerk reaction to the response yeah. I got by presenting, and then now I'm kind of waiting. And, and so the publication has not been published on my thesis. It's only one year old publication, um, and nothing is specific enough or, or uh, developed enough. I would concur with that. Also, on my experiences is that you, the U.S. is really the only uh, entity that would uh, give a method patent, issue a method patent. Uh, most other countries reject methods. And even if you have claims that are around methods, you know, they get rejected when you're filing in Europe or Japan, etc. 
um, three quick footnotes. I was going to mention this earlier. Yeah, and, and the UK in particular, you cannot patent methods of medical treatment. Right. So just period. Or procedures. Correct. Like that. Correct. Correct. Um, you probably know this, but just for the benefit of the rest of the audience, provisional applications are not published. So in Elizabeth's case, she's filed, but if she just lets it go after 12 months and doesn't file anything else that claims priority back to it, it will remain a secret. And then the third thing I'll say is, it is heartbreaking when I work, it sounds like you working with Dan are sensitive to this issue, but when I work with academics, and we've had some very painful conversations about articles they've published, and now they want to patent something that's more than a year later, and what they want to patent now might not be exactly the same. It might have been an outgrowth of what they published their thesis on in 2014. You know, we're having this conversation in 2016, but the question is obviousness. If they laid the groundwork for that in that publication, we could, that publication becomes prior art vis-a-vis -vis the subsequent filing. Can't go back. Yeah, we got another question from John. Can we follow up on that? If you file a provisional and don't follow up with a utility, does that count as prior art against the patent any it does not because it's never published. Thank you. Other questions from firms in the room? You know, I was just going to um, have Ron tell us why he's in Montana and so, also talk about his infrastructure needs because we were trying to help move his manufacturing plant from, uh, from Denver, Denver yep. up to Montana. So, and Ron, we're lucky you're in Montana, but there's reasons you're here. Uh, I'm a Montana native. I was born here. Uh, grew up on a ranch in the Flathead Valley uh, and uh, vacationed here every year and retired actually about 15, 20 years ago, I think. I, I made that attempt and uh, didn't work and, and uh, was involved with the Tech Ranch Incubator here and some of the companies that got started so I've been kind of in this mentoring mode for a long time but yeah that's what brought me to Montana this is home um, and uh, yeah I would like to move our you know we've done the economic analysis and, and all of that uh, logistics and stuff um, you know, for relocating the manufacturing facility we do we have all US suppliers that build custom compounds for our instruments so we have about 28 different suppliers with the exception of one that's in Taiwan and, then, and we do final assembly and test and then fulfillment from our Denver facility. So that's what we're looking to, to move here. We're going from building a thousand units at a time and, um, to you know 5,000 now, 25,000 and 50,000. So we're on this hockey stick curve right now for, uh, if I get a basically sign an implementation agreement with HCA, I've got to figure out how I can build 600,000 units within the next five years. Uh, so it's one of those things, and, and uh, I, I'm an engineer background as well, so I've been an uh, RF engineer. I graduated from Montana State, actually, yeah. uh, in engineering, so you know I have a lot of roots here. So it's, this is home, and that's why I, I'm here. Glad to have you here, and hopefully we can figure out how to help you scale your business a little bit further here. Um, I didn't see others from the room, and I had a couple, but I, we good? Okay, so I had a couple of questions for um, some of our other panelists. So, Daniel, you talked about the, the model with Amgen coming in and, and investing um, with your MSU-based researcher here, and I think you said that, I mean, this is, this was kind of new for MSU here, but is that the way the industry is moving, do you think? So that it's not just funding that pure R&D? Are we moving more into the, hey, let's build something together that we can actually commercialize world? Or what's your take? Um, you know, I think it all depends on the particular situation. There are, um, there are companies that are doing strategic investments, and I think in this case, you know, the Amgen VC arm is was interested in a strategic investment. Mm -hmm. It's not strictly, you know, what ROI can they get, but they want to be engaged with MSU in this research or in this technology, in addition to having some um, some skin in the game and some potential for return if it works out well. So I think universities uh, you know, nationwide or worldwide are moving more toward commercialization, but they're also moving more toward strategic alliances with companies, with the industry, or even other universities. So the, the center of gravity is, um, 
moving to accommodate not just the pure science that's always been there, the pure science of research, but more of a mind towards commercialization. And so we're trying to do more of that at MSU, yeah. uh, but you can see it in, in some other universities that are already very strong in that. And they're making accommodations for researchers to be able to play parts in the commercialization of their technology, whatever makes sense for them as individuals. Many, most researchers don't want to become CEOs of their own companies and wouldn't necessarily make the ideal CEOs, but they can still play active roles, whether that means they're like CTO or just on the board of technical advisors or they're part-time, especially in the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. I think universities are recognizing the importance of the economic, economic impact that they, that they are having on their communities and their, their, their regions, and so they're doing what they can to make these things feasible, and MSU is uh, among them. I wonder if Amgem's looking at making more strategic investments in our state. That could, would be nice. Could be. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, I, I feel like this is some, I don't know it yet, but I will learn it more as we get, as I get more into the bioscience work of, of this initiative. I'm not sure what uh, University of Montana, the kinds of relationships University of Montana may have that are parallel to that. So when I get back, I'm going to ask uh, a little, yeah. I have a question about that. Yeah. What did Surgeon give Amgen, and what is it? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but the, well, that's almost the same question. The convertible note is an agreement to, and Tony will probably uh, please me if I get this slightly wrong. It's, a, it's an agreement to invest in the company without all the financial terms being set up front. So if they give you, give you a million dollars to invest in your company, and it's, and it's so early that it's hard to say how much is that million dollars worth? Is your company already worth five million dollars or is it only worth uh, 1.5 million, in which case now they own two thirds of your company? It's like, well, okay, this is such an early idea. Why don't you go get, make some more progress and then we'll figure out later, based on your next round of investment, for instance, how much my million dollar investment today is worth. So if you got, say, say they made a the million dollar investment today and then a year you got $10 million from some large company for 10%, well then obviously your company was really worth a lot and that million dollars won't have bought that much. But maybe one year later you get you know, five hundred thousand dollars of investment, and then that company is owning twenty percent. Well, now that million dollars was really a big piece of of, of your equity. So it's, it's essentially putting off to the future how much equity they're getting for their investment. Yeah, it's that's uh, what happens is you're looking for a, a sophisticated investor that would place a value on the company at a later stage. So convertible notes are pretty common for very early stage because they generally work out better for the company because you're a non-revenue, and so you're there looking at your IP, or maybe the IP hasn't even come in yet, so there, there's just nothing you can really hang your hat on to start with, so uh, they usually work out better for the companies to do convertibles than trying to set a value that's really low, uh, usually would be very low because there's no revenue or financial metrics to base a valuation on. Yeah, convertible notes are really good. Looks like we've got a question back there, actually. I had a question about licensing a patent from the military, for example, that you know, they're trying to take a technology they developed and give it real-world applications. And, um, I don't know if you have any experience with, with that, Ron, or anybody else? Um, I do. Uh, we did a company where we licensed some technology from, uh, from, the, from a DOD supplier of technology in, for a medical application. And actually, I did a spin out of, I, I worked for Honeywell Government Aerospace Products Division. We did uh, avionics uh, guidance control systems for offensive weapon controls and things like that. So we ended up, I, I pulled some of that technology out of the, uh, and got permission by the DOD to do some basically imaging technology for a uh, medical application. So yeah, you can do that. They're, they're open to that as long as it's not classified. You really got to look at the class, you know, if it's classified technology first. Yeah, well, it's one that's available, like, yeah. through. Oh, uh, okay. Is this through TechLink? Yeah, it is. So that's actually the organization that Ann and I are both part of. Sure. So we can we can talk to you more about it or hook you up with the right people. Yeah, we're, we're in touch. I'm just okay. kind of more concerned about, like, the logistics of the relationship with the uh, agency itself that's licensing it, but it was, like, from the business perspective, um, you know, obviously they have different goals and objectives than the military does, but you kind of want to come together and make it beneficial for both parties. So 
Was it easy to work with them? Was it easy to commercialize? It's never, it's never easy to work with the government, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, but I think that, you know, their goal is not, you know, revenue, commercial, you know, from that standpoint, it's more altruistic, you know, from that standpoint, if it's, you know, if it can benefit uh, another seg segment of the, the economy or whatever, that's a benefit. So it's, it's not, they're not focused on the financial side of it. They have a mandate to foster economic development, so that's why they even do all this licensing. But it will really depend on the particular agency and the particular lab that technology came out of, how easy it is to work with them and how um, how strict the terms will end up being. Um, actually, I have a question, probably this is a good one for Anne. Um, are there, is there still such a thing as to, well, SBIR, STTR, this progression, but then sometimes there are sole source contracts that can be obtained, and I don't know that you need to go through this progression of first getting SBIR or STTR, but some of these agencies, I, do they do they still do that? I mean, they do sole source. So, so I, I'm going to take a, a quick step back. So my, my role in Montana State Economic Development is really to evangelize that certain type of S, uh, federal funding, which is the Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer. There are a number of other types of grants and contracts that are available for research and development that I definitely encourage people to consider. But let's so talk about SBIR and STTR. Um, that is, if, you, if you've gone through the SBIR, STTR, if you've won one of those awards, and they really are sister programs, I'll just use the term SBIR, uh, that technology, you've gone through a competitive uh, process to win those awards. And for some of the agencies that are contracting agencies that are uh, likely to be a customer of yours, like the Department of Defense, uh, they, uh, you have proceeded through a competitive process already. So for that technology that is a, your technology that has evolved from an SBIR award, you can stand on sole source rights uh, when that agency requires that type of technology. It's not, uh, it is the right, it is part of the SBIR policy directive. Uh, it does not mean that you, everybody knows about it. You will be working with procurement uh, managers, officers within those agencies, and you'll need to make sure that they understand this technology was developed with Small Business Innovation Research funding, hence uh, I, I am authorized to, you know, you can sole source me. They don't have to go out to a competitive bid. So yes, that is. That's really just part thinking of that. that might be a, a, a nice thing for an early stage company to have in its quiver. You know, by the way, I have this sole source contract. Yeah, it, it certainly is a wonderful thing to have when you know, again, working with the contracting agencies, the agencies that will write contract contracts that will be your one of your market sectors. Uh, it is a good thing to think about. I, I tend to, I am a private sector girl. My background is in kind of software sales, things like that. I think it's wonderful, but uh, don't hold your hat on any no. of these, right? Don't, don't rest your hat on any one thing, mm -hmm. uh, making sure your company is successful. But if you have it, then you might to turn it down. That sounds like a good wrap up point. But I would give uh, our other panelists one parting we shot in terms of a question. Oh, we do? Sorry, go for it. It's yes. phase 2B, is that what you said? Phase 2B. Okay. It's basically a match grant for every dollar you raise from outside. The NIH will come back and match dollar for dollar. Right. Which is it up extends. to $4 million, which is really good. You go to investors saying, for every dollar you put in, you're getting $2. Would you care to comment on that program? And oh, that's are great. agencies going to go that way besides just the NCI? Yeah, so, so actually a number. So each agency has some type of sequential phase two funding. And that's, uh, that some will call them different things, but for NIH, the National Institutes of Health and National Cancer Institute, uh, they'll call it a phase 2B. Uh, those are actually brilliant. Uh, I, I, uh, the comment is, do it. If you have a phase two award with a, any of these agencies, look into the additional assistance that is available. There are things like sequential funding, which we mentioned, Sometimes some agencies will call them a phase two and a half, mm -hmm. phase two B, uh, sequential. 
Uh, that kind of matching type of so, a lot of them will have that matching component, exactly. Some of them, uh, there are some other assistance uh, programs that they, they are developing or are building into the programs now, even at the phase one, again, phase one is that first type of award that you win with an SBIR or STTR. For commercialization assistance, again, this is, SBIR and STTR is intended for innovative, blow your mind technology that, that has commercial potential. It is an economic development stimulus focus. So the uh, commercialization has been one of the things that they've been complained, you know, knocked on, like, hey, we don't have as much help commercializing this technology that you're funding. So uh, technical and business assistance, uh, the acronym is TABA. You may hear about that. I would say if anybody's looking at SBIR, STTR, to read in the funding opportunity announcements, look for words about commercialization assistance because you can tack on additional money, a request for additional money that will normally, previously, was not, you were not allowed to use any of your SBIR money for market research, sales, things like that. So th those types of things are really important to look for. And we can try to help you. Uh, tap into to those things. It's a great question. Hallie's pointing at me, but I'm not sure what it means. Go this way. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks for that. So I, I do want to, we're at 3.30, but I want to give 10 seconds to each of you. A lot of information's been conveyed at this training, and although people would have the opportunity to watch it again, I mean, what's that parting thought you have for uh, early stage bioscience businesses or would-be entrepreneurs, what's that one thing that you hope they'll take with them? Go, Tony. I'll just start with disclosure. Um, that's important under, not only with respect to trademarks, but patents. If you aren't aware of the disclosure deadlines, um, the rules pertaining to public disclosures, um, you can find that your inventions in the public domain. And uh, although the U.S. has a one-year grace period, most foreign countries do not. They are absolute novelty jurisdictions. So. Disclosure. Any yeah. questions you'd like. Nice. Okay. How about you? Um, well, I'd just say if anyone's interested in talking about how they could work with the university, please come talk to me afterwards um, or any other questions that you think uh, we can help with. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, similarly for me, from my takeaway, bioscience takes a long time to commercialize. I think it's, uh, for any of the people that I talk to, any of the types of technologies, understanding where your eventual market is going to be is really important. You don't have to identify everybody who you, you're going to sell to, but it certainly is uh, if you're looking to tap into research and development funding to help get your product to a stage where you can sell it, you should have an understanding of where, uh, you know, where your technology will fit to the marketplace. It is very, especially with the early, early stage technology, you think this is so cool, I want to build this, make sure you know who you're going to sell it to as well. Yeah, come talk Sorry. to me if you need help. Uh, get a really strong, active board. Uh, not don't go after a name that just for a name, but get somebody who wants to roll up their sleeves and participate and advise. Uh, you can't you know, can't dismiss the, the value of that because it's somebody you can tap into and and you know they won't normally it's just a few shares you give them and and they're more than happy to have something they can participate in and get involved in. So. That's, that's probably one of the most important things you can do is that you don't be an island, you know, you know, lean on other people. And in particular, I can see a lot of companies make the mistake of going after some high profile names in their industry and, and those people never provide the detailed information or active involvement there. You know, they'll just collect some stock and go on to the next thing. So, you know, find somebody that wants to be engaged and, and has experience that can help you. And, not just say the technology, but market. Yeah. You know, get a diverse board that you know, financial guy, uh, a clinical person that somebody might have uh, a good handle on the clinical aspects of, of studies and things like that that can help guide you through that. So you can just pick out all the different expertise you need to get to market wise, and, and you can time the board too. As, and if you if you're just in development early stages, go for the kind of board that will support that that phase of where you're at. And then as you get into commercialization, look for a board that can help you more understand how, how do I develop this market? How do I sell to it? Who are the strategic partners I can align with me to help accelerate that adoption? Disclosure, 
come see me, which I'm going to put in the broader reach out, you know, bucket, and then uh, for sure understanding your market, which a number of our panelists have mentioned, and active, diverse, roll up your sleeve kind of board members, absolutely. All right, well, thanks everybody for coming today, um, and please join me in a round of applause for our panelists. Thanks, guys. All right, so on behalf of you and the Montana World Trade Center and all of my friends and colleagues that are part of the Montana Bioscience Cluster Initiative, thanks for coming.